This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're beginning a new series that I've titled Last Stop. In this series, I will detail cases where crimes are committed on public transportation. This month, I'll be sharing two cases that are more well-known and two others you might not have heard about before. But first up is a case that was much publicized when it occurred. It was such a strange and bizarre kidnapping case that the details of it made national and even international headlines in 1976. This is chapter one of Last Stop, the Chowchilla School Bus Kidnapping. A small farming community located in Central California was the setting for a random and bizarre crime in the summer of 1976. Chowchilla, California at that time had a population of less than 5,000 residents. Most of the town's families supported themselves with small independent farms or by working in local industries that supported agriculture-related businesses that dominated the region. Chowchilla is located inland, well off the beaten path. The closest city is Fresno, located 40 miles to the south. Being a small town, there wasn't a lot to occupy the town's children over the long summer vacation from school, so the Dairyland Elementary School District offered a summer school program for kids from the ages of 5 to 14. 175 students were picked up by school buses to start the day at 8.45 a.m. The mornings were spent working on academics, like history and math, but the afternoons were spent on fun activities, like arts and crafts and swimming. July 15, 1976, was the second-to-last day of the summer school program. The children had been enjoying their time at summer school so much that a few of them had put together a petition, asking for it to be extended through the end of the month. Most of the students, several teachers, and even one of their bus drivers, Ed Ray, had signed the petition in support. The day ended at 3.45 p.m., and students lined up to board the four buses that would take them home. 55-year-old Frank Edward Ray, called Ed by the faculty, and Mr. Ray by the kids, was driving the last bus to leave the school that day. Just before he closed the doors, one more boy ran up to board the bus. Michael Marshall was 14 years old. Normally, he would only attend the morning academic program and be picked up by his mother at noon. But Michael was being punished because he and his friend Dougie had gotten into trouble together the day before. After school, he and Dougie were hanging out at Mike's house and grew bored. They decided to drink some beer they found in the fridge. Before long, they were drunk. They were stumbling and goofing around when Mike's mother returned home and caught them. As a punishment, she told Michael that she was not going to pick him up from school, probably so he wouldn't be home unsupervised for so many hours and get into more mischief. This meant that Mike would have to take the bus home with the little kids. This was not ideal for Michael. First of all, he'd have to ride the bus home with a bunch of little kids. Even worse, he'd have to wait for hours after his school program was over before he could go home. Mike, like his father, was an experienced rodeo rider and competed in junior rodeo shows. He had learned to love the rodeo from his father, who had the most dangerous job in the rodeo, that of a rodeo clown performer. Mike says he ate, slept, and breathed rodeo in those days and he was always anxious to get home and get on his horse to practice roping and riding. Now he wouldn't be home until close to 4 p.m., and the whole afternoon would be lost. But then, he thought, things could be worse, and the punishment he received wasn't too bad. He'd just have to suck it up. So he was relieved when he was able to flag down the last bus to leave the school that day. He asked Mr. Ray if he could take the bus home, and he was assured he could. He jumped on for the short ride. Mike, at 14, was the oldest child on the bus. The youngest was four-year-old Monica Ardry. Most of the rest of the kids were between the ages of 5 and 12. Jeff Brown, age 11, was on the bus, as was his sister, Jennifer, age 9. Robert Gonzalez was 10 and had a younger brother on the bus as well. Linda Carrejo was on the bus along with her three sisters. Edward Ray had been a school bus driver for the Chowchilla School District for over 26 years. He was well-known and well-liked by all of the children. He was also a local farmer, operating a small farm with his wife, Odessa. 
the bus pulled away from the school just after 3.45 in the afternoon. It would make four stops to drop off all of the children. The trip began uneventfully, and Ray made the first three stops without incident. But at about 4.15 p.m., with 26 children still left on the bus, 19 girls and 7 boys, the bus made an unscheduled stop. While driving down Rural Avenue 21, a narrow gravel road, Ray was forced to stop the bus because a van was parked blocking the road in front of him. The hood was up, and Ray decided to see if they needed any help. But just as soon as he'd opened the bus door, and before he had time to get up out of the driver's seat, a man burst into the bus, wearing pantyhose over his head to conceal his face. He was brandishing a shotgun. He ordered Ray into the back of the bus, while two other men emerged from the van parked in the road and also boarded the bus. Shouting at Ray and a couple of the older boys, including Michael, to get to the back of the bus, the masked men began yelling at the kids who were frightened and began to cry. Shut up and do what you're told if you don't want to get hurt, they snarled at the terrified children. Unknown to anyone but them, the three men had been planning the hijacking for more than a year. Fred Woods, Richard Schoenfeld, and his brother James Schoenfeld were all in their early 20s and were all sons of wealthy families. Fred's father was a successful entrepreneur who owned and managed several businesses around the state. Fred lived with his parents in Portola Valley. Rick and Jim Schoenfeld were the sons of a doctor, and they lived in Atherton, a small Northern California town that is ranked as having one of the highest per capita incomes among U.S. towns of its size. The three young men became friends, and using family money, they tried to launch more than a few get-rich-quick schemes between them. All were unsuccessful. They all enjoyed working around cars, and Fred had started a trucking business, but was losing money. Their parents had begun to lean on them to start earning their own way. They were going through the money provided by their families quickly, purchasing cars and throwing away money on unsuccessful financial dealings. At the same time, they enjoyed watching crime films like The French Connection and Dirty Harry, two popular movies of the 1970s. They started talking about what it would take to pull off the perfect crime. Before long, they started thinking up a plan to get their hands on some money. Real money, they said. At first, Rick, especially, thought it was all just talk. Just a fun conversation to pass the time. But then Fred started to seem really serious about pulling off a kidnapping for ransom, and Jim seemed to be going along with him. Over several months, the plan began to take shape. While they could kidnap one person for some money, they thought, if they kidnapped a whole group of people, they could demand a lot more. They began to think about hijacking a school bus full of kids to hold hostage. People would certainly pay whatever was demanded to get their kids back, they decided. Later, it was speculated that they first got the idea of hijacking a school bus from a book titled The Day the Children Vanished by Hugh Pentecost. In the 1958 book, a bus full of children is abducted to use as a distraction to lure residents away from a small town. While the town was occupied looking for the children, the criminals in the story planned to rob the town's bank. The book was found in the stacks of the Chowchilla Library. As the time approached, the trio began to put their plan into place. The measures they took to pull off the caper were extensive and costly. They staked out a couple of other towns, including Rio Vista, located halfway between the San Francisco Bay Area and Sacramento. They also rejected the town of Madera, another central California town just south of Chowchilla. The plan was to be carried out as follows. The school bus would be hijacked with the children on board. They would then be transported to a hidden location where they would be kept until the kidnappers received a $5 million ransom for their safe return. Once they had the money in hand, they would send word to where the children could be found. By then, they believed, they would be long gone with the cash. The place to hide the children would be their biggest hurdle. Where could you hide a couple dozen children for at least 24 hours? This was the amount of time they thought would be required to pull off their perfect crime from beginning to end. The plan they came up with was as bizarre as it was tricky and would become the worst nightmare any of the residents of Chowchilla could ever have imagined.
Woods and the Schoenfeld brothers actually tried to hijack the school bus a day earlier, but the timing didn't work out. They didn't give up, however, and came back the next day to try once again. On July 15, 1976, at 4.15 in the afternoon, the Chowchilla school bus was hijacked with 26 children and one adult inside. The bus was commandeered by one of the kidnappers, while another was inside pointing a gun at the hostages. The third man followed behind in the van. The bus turned off the road and went through a bumpy field, driving through a thick grove of bamboo. The bus was shaking back and forth as it cut through the dense thicket. Some of the kids grew frightened and began to scream and cry. The kidnappers kept yelling at them to shut up, which only frightened them more. Finally, the bus came to a shuddering stop. It was parked well off the road, hidden by the bamboo thicket on one side and an almond grove on the other. The bus now sat in a dry slough. At the end of the slough, there were two more vans parked in a clearing. The kidnappers took all of the occupants off the bus at gunpoint. They were directed into the back of the two vans. Little Monica Artery had begun clinging to Mike Marshall with a vice-like grip as soon as the men entered the bus. The terrified four-year-old now would not let go of her protector, wrapping her tiny arms and legs around him. The gunman began to grow angry and yelled even louder, making the little girl scream in fright. Mike said he would carry her into the van with him and proceeded to move quickly so as not to anger the men further. They were placed into empty cargo vans with no seats and blacked-out windows. The children sat in the dark, hot vans, clinging to each other out of fright. Edward Ray, the bus driver, was in one van with half of the children, and Mike Marshall, the only teenage hostage, was in the other. The children drew as close as possible to these two men, who were their only hope to keep them safe. Central California in the middle of summer is often blazing hot, and this day was no exception. There was no air in the van, and the children were sweltering. They could not see where they were or where they were going, and the kidnappers told them nothing. Some of the children became sick from the heat and the automobile fumes and vomited in the van. Others were so scared they wet themselves. The stench began to grow unbearable. Mr. Ray and some of the older children tried to calm the younger ones by getting them to sing songs together. Some mercifully fell asleep for a bit. The time riding in the vans went on for several hours and seemed endless. Meanwhile, back in Chowchilla, parents began to grow worried when their children didn't arrive home at the usual time. Calls were placed to the school, the school district, and the bus yard. Where was the school bus? At first, parents were assured that it was probably just a slight delay. The bus might have had a breakdown, and they were sending someone out along the bus route to see where it might have stalled. They were sure that all was well and that their children would be home soon. However, they soon discovered that the bus driven by Edward Ray had made its first three stops and then simply disappeared. By 7 p.m., an all-points bulletin was put out to all police and sheriff's units in the area to be on the lookout for the missing school bus. Search parties were formed, and searches were done by ground and air. At 8 p.m., the bus was discovered hidden in the slough, but all the children, as well as the bus driver, had vanished. Panic began to take hold of the residents of Chowchilla. Edward Ray's wife and family, and the families of the missing children, were frantic. Meanwhile, in the airless vans, the hostages were at first relieved when the vehicles finally stopped and the door was opened. It was 1 a.m., and they had been driving for over eight hours. But then, one by one, each child was taken out of the van while the others were left behind in the dark, wondering what could be happening to their schoolmates. The next part of the nightmare for the children was almost unfathomable. They were being buried alive. The investigation continued. When the bus was found, they also discovered other tire tracks over those of the bus. This indicated that someone had driven away after the bus was hidden. It became clear that the children weren't just lost, They had been taken. But for what purpose? Of course, one of the first things that came to mind was that it was a kidnapping. Fresh on the minds of many people at that time was the Patty Hearst kidnapping that had occurred in the San Francisco Bay Area 
just two years earlier in 1974. Just a few years before that, in 1969, California had been terrorized by the serial killer who called himself the Zodiac. The Zodiac killer liked to taunt the police by sending letters bragging of his deeds and daring them to find him. In one such communication, he had threatened to target a school bus full of children, writing, School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot out the front tire, then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. Parents were frantic, but the authorities, while still conducting the search, were also waiting to hear word from the kidnappers, if that's what this was. But they were also puzzled, because the Patty Hearst kidnapping at least made sense from a financial motive. The Hearst family was extremely wealthy. If the families of these missing children were wealthy, that would at least be a clue. But most of the children missing were from humble farm families. Some were children of migrant farm workers. None of them were more than middle class at best. If this was a kidnap for ransom, why would the kidnappers choose these children? The FBI was called in to help work the investigation into the presumed kidnapping. The three men were planning to ask for a ransom, a large ransom, $5 million. In their convoluted thinking, they believed that the state of California would cough up the money to get the schoolchildren back safely. They had read that the state was sitting on a budget surplus and thought this could be used to meet their demands. Yes, because the state government has a big old ATM machine or whatever and can just pull out scads of cash. Right. And where did they decide to hide the hostages? Well, this was the most bizarre part of their plan. They had driven the children to a rock quarry located on the outskirts of Livermore, California, about 100 miles north of Chowchilla. The reason the drive had taken so many hours was because they were stalling to arrive at the quarry property when it was dark and there were no employees around. They knew the quarry well. It was one of the businesses owned by Fred Wood's father, and the trio had spent several months getting it ready to put their plan into place. Woods had bought the three transport vans from a prison surplus auction. He also bought a large moving van. He then rented big earth movers to dig out a giant pit on the quarry property. There was a dirt ramp that led to the pit. When the giant hole was dug in the ground, they drove the moving van into the pit. The vehicle was now located below ground. This was where they planned to hide their hostages. This is something you really must see to believe. I posted pictures on the Once Upon a Crime Facebook and Instagram pages, and you can view them there. After they had the moving truck hidden underground, they began to cover the top several feet deep with dirt and rocks. But soon, the weight of the dirt began to cave in the roof of the truck. They had to stop to wedge a few wooden beams inside between the floor and the top of the van to try to keep it from caving in further. They then stocked the buried moving van with some mattresses and a little bit of food, cereal, peanut butter, bread, and some water. They connected a hose to the outside of the van, and to it they attached a makeshift van. This was supposed to supply air into the van below ground. But the fan was not very powerful, only running on a few small batteries. It would do little in the way of keeping a couple of dozen people cool underground in the almost 100-degree heat. As each child was taken from the vans that had transported them to the quarry, they were asked their full name, age, address, phone number, and were required to give the kidnappers an item of clothing that they were wearing. The kidnappers planned to use these items to prove that they had the children. Each child was then made to climb down a ladder into the dark hole that was the inside of the moving van. To the children, it felt like they were being buried alive. One of the girls, Linda Carejo, would later recall, It was buried into the earth. It was like a tomb. It was like a giant coffin for all of us. Edward Ray was also placed into the hole, and he was given a flashlight, one small light that would keep them all from being in complete darkness. They saw the mattresses and the food, and this did not bring any relief. Just how long were they going to be held in this coffin? The children began to cry and call out for their parents. Ed Ray tried to assure them that they were safe, but it was a hard thing to do. He had no idea what the kidnappers had planned for them. Perhaps they were planning to ask for a ransom and then let them go. But looking around at the surroundings, 
he could not be sure that they wouldn't die here anyway before that could even happen. They were all dehydrated in the sweltering heat and airless container they were stuck inside. The water was going fast. The children had been held captive for hours, without a bathroom, and some had soiled themselves. There was a makeshift toilet placed in this prison, a wooden box with a hole cut in it. But this just made the smell worse, and everyone was sick and miserable. They were held captive in this hell for several hours. The kidnappers had not returned. What was going to happen to them? How long could they survive this misery? Fred Woods and the Schoenfeld brothers set out to communicate their ransom demands after leaving their hostages underground. They first tried to place a phone call to the Chowchilla Police Department to relay their instructions. But in 1976, they were dealing with a pretty basic phone system. And what was happening in Chowchilla was keeping all the phone lines into the police department busy. There were children from 17 different families missing, as well as the bus driver. All of the parents and other family members were continuously trying to reach the police to get information, report their missing loved ones, and generally get updated on the search. Because of this, the kidnappers continued to hear a busy signal when they tried to reach the police department and could not get through. This continued for three hours. They finally gave up and thought of a plan B. They would write a ransom note and somehow have it delivered. Meanwhile, the conditions the hostages were in was growing worse by the hour. They had been underground for over a dozen hours now. The water was almost gone, as was the food. Some children started to faint from the heat and their terror. Ed Ray could see that something needed to be done. He didn't know how or when someone would find them, or if they would be rescued at all. He feared that some or all of them would die before that happened. There was also two times when the roof started to cave in. Ray knew that if this happened, they would all be buried alive. They felt like they were suffocating. After several hours of the small fan pumping air underground, the batteries gave out and there was no fresh air being supplied. Something had to be done. Mr. Ray told a few of the older boys that they might not make it out, but it wasn't going to be because they didn't try. They set out to come up with an escape plan. First, Mr. Ray, Mike Marshall, and two other boys, Jeff Brown and Robert Gonzalez, gathered up the 17 mattresses that were strewn around the van and stacked them on top of one another. They had noticed that there was a metal plate affixed to the roof of the van. If they could reach it, perhaps they could try and pry it open. The first bit of luck was bestowed on them. The mattresses were high enough that when they stood on the top one, they could reach the metal plate. They saw that this was possibly a way out. They first needed something to be able to pry it open with. The only thing available was one of the wooden beams that was being used to keep the roof from caving in. But they had no choice. They had to try and remove it and pray for the best. The second piece of luck in their favor was that the roof held. They wedged the board into the opening in the metal plate and were able to get it open. Once they did, they saw that several large heavy vehicle batteries had been placed over the lid to hold it closed. Little by little, Ray and the boys inched the batteries until they were able to move them out of the way. It was slow and difficult work, and they were afraid that at any moment the kidnappers could return. If they did, they would surely kill them, they thought. They kept going as fast as they could to find a way out. Once the batteries were moved, they still had to clear out several feet of dirt and debris that had been placed on the roof of the moving van. After clearing Earth away for what seemed like an eternity, they finally saw a shaft of light. They had made it to the top. They quickly cleared a hole large enough for one of the smaller boys to fit through. It was his assignment to go up and survey the area to let the others know if the coast was clear. It was. By now, the kidnappers had given up trying to reach the police by phone and were busy deciding what to do next. As they were planning their next steps, they fell asleep. This was the last bit of luck the hostages needed to make their escape. One by one, Ray lifted each child out through the hole they had dug and up to the older boys waiting outside. Finally, he crawled out as well, the last to leave the hell in which they'd been entombed for 16 hours. Quickly and quietly, they made their way across the quarry in the dark. 
It was 4 a.m. when they came upon a guard shack. The employee came out and saw the group and immediately knew who they were. The news of the missing children had been playing on television news reports for almost the past 24 hours. As he came towards them, he told the ragged and exhausted group, The world has been looking for you. The authorities were notified of the discovery of the 27 people who had all escaped their kidnappers, ending the most bizarre and the largest mass kidnapping in California history. An FBI spokesperson made the following statement. They are all in good shape. The bus driver is in good shape. We have no subjects in custody. The investigation is continuing. And then he said what the families have been waiting to hear for 36 long hours. The parents will be reunited with their children tonight. The children are all right. The driver is all right. These words ended one of the most bizarre incidents in the history of the Central Valley. The 26 Chowchilla youngsters and driver Ed Ray were found in this desolate area near Livermore. Imprisoned in the body of an old semi-truck, Ray and the kids dug themselves out and went for help. The area was sealed to photographers as criminologists combed the cave and surrounding areas for clues to the identity of the kidnappers. The group was taken to Santa Rita Correctional Center and placed in the care of the FBI. Some suffered from overexposure, but considering their ordeal, they were fine. While parents and friends waited anxiously in Chowchilla, the FBI questioned Ray and the children. A bus was charted. At long last, the trip home began. And then they were home, tired, scared, but safe. Ed Ray, the bus driver, was hailed as a hero for his part in getting the children home safely. He spoke plainly and humbly when questioned by reporters. We had a lot of crying and begging for their mamas and stuff, but I kept quieting them down to see the guys wouldn't get mad at us. Did, Did you ever find out why they were doing this? No, sir. The children had held up well, happy to be home and safe once again. They were described as brave by Mr. Ray. Some of the kids told of their experiences with the kidnappers. We had food and stuff, so we could um, be down there in those restrooms and stuff. I thought they would just had an urge to do something, so I just went along with them. I wasn't about to go against them, that gun. We didn't, what do you want to do, what we did to you, and they said, no, you just shut up and sat on there. And we were scared and everybody was crying. Fred Woods and Rick and Jim Schoenfeld woke up the next morning, July 17th, to learn that their captives had escaped. They'd never even managed to make the ransom request, either by phone or letter, at all. They also learned that a manhunt was underway by the FBI and state and local law enforcement agencies. The trio fled as soon as they heard that bit of news. Fred and James decided to try for the Canadian border to hide out. They split up before making their way north. By that evening, Fred was able to cross into Canada and hide out in a Vancouver hotel. James Schoenfeld first tried to cross the border at Idaho, but was denied entry for not having the proper documents. He then tried again two days later, attempting to cross the Washington border into Canada. However, a search of James's car was conducted, and Fred had not told him that he'd left a pistol hidden in the car. James wasn't charged with anything, but was turned away once again. The next day, James went back to Idaho once more, abandoning the car in Coeur d'Alene. He purchased a truck and drove back to Washington. He didn't try and cross again, but just laid low in Spokane. But Richard Schoenfeld, who'd been the most reluctant to carry out the kidnapping plot, felt remorse immediately afterwards. He alone returned home to confess to his parents that he was involved in the kidnapping. Investigators were able to get a lot of good information from Edward Ray about the kidnappers. He described all three, as well as the guns they were carrying, and most valuable of all, he was able to recall the license plate number of one of the vans. Ray wanted to do everything he could to help catch the men, so he agreed to be put under hypnosis to help him recall any details that might assist in the search. It was while under hypnosis that he was able to remember the license plate number. The vehicle was tied back to Fred Woods. 
As well, once they were able to excavate the moving van that the hostages had been buried in, that truck also was registered in Fred Wood's name. In addition, it was discovered that Wood's father owned Cal Rock Quarry, where the truck was buried. Then on July 23rd, the media announced that Richard Schoenfeld had confessed to being one of the kidnappers and named his brother and Fred Woods as his accomplices. He was being held on $1 million bail. James drove back to the Bay Area, but wasn't quite ready to turn himself in and was still in hiding. Fred, in Canada, wrote a letter to a friend telling where he was hiding, hoping to get some assistance. But the friend, knowing Fred was wanted, turned the letter over to the FBI. Police began staking out the areas where they believed the fugitives were hiding. On July 29th, James was on his way home, planning to surrender, when he was arrested in Atherton. Fred was arrested on the same day in Vancouver, Canada. Both were held on $1 million bail and charged, along with Richard Schoenfeld, with more than 40 felony charges, including kidnapping for ransom, kidnapping with bodily harm, and burglary. They all pled not guilty. Their trial was moved from Madera County, where Chowchilla was located, to Alameda County in Northern California. The investigation had yielded a ransom note that demanded $5 million in exchange for the children. It was discovered at Fred Woods' parents' estate. Court proceedings dragged on while defense attorneys tried to get the ransom note and other evidence found at the Woods' home thrown out, claiming an improper search had been conducted that yielded the items. The judge finally ruled that there were errors in the affidavit for the search warrant, but they were not serious enough to invalidate the warrant and the evidence found. When the defendants learned that the ransom note was going to be allowed at trial, they changed their pleas. On July 25, 1977, Frederick Woods, Richard Schoenfeld, and James Schoenfeld pled guilty to 27 counts of kidnapping for ransom. They stuck with their not guilty pleas on the five counts of kidnapping with bodily injury. At that time in California, a conviction for kidnapping with bodily injury carried a mandatory sentence of life without the possibility of parole. Kidnapping for ransom carried a minimum penalty of seven years in prison. They also waived a jury trial, opting to have the judge determine whether they could be found guilty of the more serious charge. The bodily injury charges were added by the state prosecutor due to fainting, nosebleeds, and stomach pain suffered by some of the children, not to mention the psychological injury, which the court would not even consider. The judge found all three guilty of all charges and sentenced them to life without the possibility of parole. But in 1981, this was overturned by the appeals court, which ruled that there was no bodily harm. The three men would now be eligible to seek parole. Richard Schoenfeld was the first to be paroled. In 2012, after 20 times before the parole board, he was finally deemed eligible and released. He moved in with his mother, who was reported to be living in a condominium in Mountain View, California. His brother, James Schoenfeld, was released on August 2, 2015. Frederick Woods continues to seek release, but his last time before the board in 2015, he was denied once again. He has since given new details about the crime. Woods shared the plans they had in place once they received the ransom money. He admitted that he had also rented a warehouse in San Jose, where they would take the money. He also hired a man to build a lead box in which to store the cash. This would prevent any tracking devices from being detected that might be placed with the money. He'd also purchased an x-ray machine to examine the money for exploding dye packs that might also have been planted. But the parole board thought that even after 40 years and at the age of 61, Woods was still minimizing his crime and not taking full responsibility for the harm that he'd done to his victims. He said that none of the children had actually been harmed, and if they said they were, they were remembering it differently than it had actually occurred. He said that he didn't see any of them crying, and at times, they were even singing. Woods also continued to live his life of privilege while in prison, purchasing over 60 cars that he collected on the outside and that were being stored for him. He'd also been married twice while incarcerated. Finally, he had disciplinary infractions while in prison, including being in possession of pornography, some of it depicting nude children. He'd also been caught with contraband cell phones. 
he was denied parole once again in 2015. He will be eligible for parole consideration again this year in 2018. It wasn't until an interview 20 years after the kidnapping that the three men apologized for their actions. Jim Schoenfeld said, I am very sorry, deeply sorry for what I've done. Rick Schoenfeld said, I was immature. I was the follower, and I made an extremely stupid decision here. Woods said, It was just a lot of pain and suffering we put everybody through that we didn't realize we were doing at the time. But now I just hope that everyone is going on with their lives. Everything can be somewhat back to normal. The 26 children of Chowchilla kidnapping are now adults with children of their own. Over the years, they have experienced many challenges from nightmares and anxiety to depression and substance abuse. Many of them have written to the parole board or attended their kidnappers' parole hearings to tell the board about how the crime has affected them and to speak out against their kidnappers being released. Each time one of the kidnappers was paroled, their victims experienced increased fear and anxiety. Some have reported experiencing flashbacks and suffering panic attacks. Some also say that they've been unable to live a normal life due to their extreme anxiety. Those who've raised their own children struggled with being overprotective and the fear that they had at simply allowing their children to attend a field trip or a sleepover or ride a school bus. Some of the children were treated for a time by a psychiatrist, but post-traumatic stress was not understood as well back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, when the children needed the most help and support. Staying in Chowchilla made them feel safe, many report, because of the outpouring of love and support they received from the community after their ordeal. But every time one of the perpetrators was back in the news, and especially when they were paroled, all the fear and anxiety came flooding back. Some of the kidnapping victims now have filed a lawsuit against Woods and the Schoenfelds for false imprisonment, reckless infliction of emotional distress, and assault and battery. California allows victims to sue up to 10 years after their kidnappers are paroled. The suit has not yet been settled. Frank Edward Ed Ray remained a beloved citizen of Chowchilla. Five weeks after the kidnapping, the town celebrated the first Ed Ray and Children's Day. Ray was presented with an award for outstanding community service by Governor Jerry Brown. He eventually sold his farm, and he and his wife moved into town. When he did so, he sold the yellow school bus, which had been given to him, to another resident who later stored it in Ray's hometown of La Grande, California. It has been put on display as part of a small history museum. Many of the children visited and were permitted to write messages on the school bus to Mr. Ray to thank him. Ed Ray died in 2012 at the age of 91. He still lived in Chowchilla. He was survived by his wife, Odessa, two sons, three grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. However, dozens of others who grew up in Chowchilla and rode Mr. Ray's bus considered him their grandfather as well. Many of the 26 children who were with him on that fateful summer day in 1976 came to visit him in his last days to give him one more hug and thank him one more time. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. If you'd like to support the podcast and get some added perks like exclusive merchandise, early release episodes, bonus content, and more, you can become a Patreon supporter by going to patreon.com slash once upon a crime. Thanks. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>